give you two guesses what we're going to restore this time. Yeah, I don't think you need two guesses. Um, you perfectly know what this is, but more specifically, this is a Grundig CF5000-2 cassette deck. Alright, before I'm going to connect the tape deck to the AC power, let's check uh, the, well, the primary of the transformer, if it has a transformer, but I think it has. So uh, let's check the multimeter first. Yeah, okay, it's working. Alright, well almost 200 ohms, you know, but um, let's see if we flip the switch, or the power switch, oh, also 190 ohms, well 198, um, <laughs> that doesn't bode. Uh, anything good. I mean, yeah, let's see what happens if I flip it back and forth a few times. Well, the power switch doesn't seem to work. Um, okay, so what this tells me is that just to be on the safe side, um, I will have to uh, take the cover off and have a visual check inside first. Alright, all the screws are released, so let's see if we can open it up for a closer look inside. find inside. Alright, so this is the inside of the cassette deck. And just as I suspected, it, there's a transformer right here uh, to power the power supply. And well, at first glance, everything seems to be in order compared to a lot of cassette decks I've seen in the past <clears throat> this one certainly looks a lot simpler I would say yeah it is I mean say compared to the brown C301 cassette deck uh, this Grundy CF5000-2 is this way, way much simpler in setup than, than the brown. Uh, I do see a few minor defects, let's say, like, or, well, things that, that look a little bit suspicious, you know, like the wiring doesn't look that fresh let's say and the on off switch which is out of your viewing field I think let's see the on off switch which is here okay um, I'm looking at the on off switch mechanism inside and I can't see anything wrong with it I mean viewed from outside from this point of view but yeah maybe maybe we'll have to open it up and then have a look a closer look at it uh, I'll have
have to unmount it anyhow uh, if I want to work uh, on it. So there are quite a few electrolytics in here and I suspect a few may have been replaced although mm, maybe this is factory um, it's certainly not the neatest uh, component board or PCB that I've seen compared to other cassette decks I've seen in the past but yeah, we. in any case there are, I will replace all the electrolytics anyhow uh, just to be you know on the safe side um, and usually you know replacing the electrolytics in the past has saved me a lot of headache uh, taking the effort to do that um, sure it costs some money and all that but uh, you know um, what's the use of, of keeping the old electrolytics and then <coughs> maybe um, on short term damaging the electronics of the cassette deck right uh, rather than make the effort now since it's open anyhow to replace them and then spend say 10-15 bucks on, on replacing the electrolytics uh, and and keeping it in, in working order you know so uh, yeah um, okay let's do one more thing now since it's open let's measure let's measure the uh, let's measure the the fuse inside on the transformer all right so there's a fuse right here on the transformer let me show you okay so let's measure it all right okay so the the fuse seems to be in working order um, so there's every chance that that the transformer is still good uh, which is a relief I mean uh, uh, I I don't like to replace transformers uh, it's a hassle and it costs quite a bit more than a few electrolytics all right I inserted a cassette so let's try the simple functions first uh, the rewind and the fast forward oh that's not so good okay neither the rewind nor the fast forward work okay then let's see play 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 okay it doesn't it's not called play on this uh, cassette deck it's called start okay well let's press the start button well that's not so good so neither the <laughs> neither the rewind nor the forced fast forward seem to work and nor does the play button or in this case the start button all right um, I'll, I'll be honest with you I kind of expected this uh, because I read up a little on, on these type of cassette decks and uh, and oh by the way to release the the front of, of the cassette deck you only need to undo four screws two on each side and uh, you need to release the potentiometer there's a like a large nut which you just need to unscrew carefully uh, from the front it's a bit hard to do but with a bit of patience you can do it now the problem I was mentioning with the
these type of cassette decks is that uh, at least a number of the gears inside of these cassette decks seem to you could say to fall to dust all right so they well they they don't age well and they they fall apart and um, since I, I suspected that might happen, I ordered a few new gears for this uh, cassette deck. And uh, yeah, it does seem to have been the case that it, it fell apart, unfortunately. Well, at least one gear fell apart. Fortunately for me, um, the glue which held the lens uh, which covers the decibel meter of the cassette deck um, has uh, you could say putrefied and, and doesn't do its job anymore it doesn't keep the lens uh, attached to the front bezel any longer which is a good thing because I, uh, as you can tell it's heavily scratched so I will need to polish it and, uh, and for that uh, it, it would be best if I could unmount it from the front, right? Alright, I'm measuring the secondary of the transformer with those clips, uh, clips leads you see there and uh, it reads uh, 1.7 ohms right here 1.7 ohms uh, so I think uh, I think the secondary of the transformer is good so the cassette deck not getting power uh, might be caused by something else and the next uh, suspect I mean after the transformer of course would be the power supply right so um, there the power supply is broken up in two parts inside the Grundig so you have the low power part which is located right here all right and then there is the high power you could say or the hot part which is located inside this enclosure here uh, which is a power transistor mounted here alright before you're going to unmount anything in any sort of, of out of any sort of device it always pays off to take a long hard look at what you're up against and um, in this case, obviously, we'll have to unmount the cassette deck mechanism because there's, uh, and, and more specifically, we're going to unmount it from the front of the chassis of the Grundig CF5000 because obviously there's no other way to get at the underlying mechanism, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, not only are we going to have to mechanically release it from the chassis but there are also a couple of connectors I identified that will also need releasing there is the connector right here uh, this green wire here which leads to the motor and then there is this uh, connector with a, a green a red and a black lead which I suspect connects to the erase and uh, record and playback heads of the cassette deck, right? So, uh, and that connector is, is connected down there on the main PCB. Now, um, I did have a good look, close look at the mechanism and I, I identified at least three screws that will need releasing. Um, it's not that obvious, but I'll try to show it to you. So down there, on
on the left corner of the, the chassis, uh, I would say at around 7 o'clock, you see one screw, which probably will need releasing. And then there's that screw over there at, I'd say, 11 o'clock. That one will need releasing. And then there's one more, and that one is pretty well hidden. And, and you uh, maybe you can see it down there in between the front PCB and the mechanism. So I'm shining the light on it. Wait, maybe I can shine the laser at it. So down there, right there, is is another screw, okay, which can be reached through this half moon opening here. All right, so. Those three screws will need releasing. Um, also, there are some very intricate and, and <coughs> plastic levers which will need uh, undoing. And uh, fortunately for me, I believe I can get away with just sliding them out from these horizontal, uh, vertical sliders. Yeah, so this one here and the other one over there and then the two connectors I just showed you so yeah um, give me a moment to unscrew the mechanism and unplug it from the PCB and then we'll have a closer look at the whole thing alright so I got the me mechanism free but uh, it wasn't as simple as undoing the, the three screws I indicated first. So there are indeed those three screws you need to undo. But you also need to um, slide off the buttons. Okay, so these little buttons, in fact. Okay. Uh, and and you, you simply pull them off gently out of... You simply pull them off gently from these little uh, tabs here, plastic tabs. These are very brittle, so you have to be, well, you have to be a bit careful when pulling them loose, the buttons, I mean. Um, also, what I noticed is that you need to unscrew the counter mechanism, which is mounted in this opening here first with two screws by the way and and that's the most treacherous part of all um, the, the whole mechanism was blocked inside the inside the the, sh the chassis by a tab sticking out on the main PCB this tab right here in fact yeah you can just about see it this tab here and um, to do that you need to I know this sounds a bit laborious but well you know that's how it is you need to bend slightly the tabs of this center separating panel yeah and then gently bend this main metal bracket here outwards until the this center bracket lets go okay and then you slide it just back in place temporarily at least you know like this it's a bit hard to do because it's rubbing. And you know, it's it would be easier just releasing it, you know. Like this. Like that. And then you can slide this back. Technically, there you go. And there you go. Alright, so then you slide back this center bracket 
until these little tabs here stick out from the support bracket on the side, right? Uh, and then we're not there, we're not done yet. So I temporarily reattach this. So then the bottom plate of the chassis uh, has also screws and you need to release the front right screw you see it right here so at the, the front and on the right side at the bottom of the chassis you need to release that screw as well uh, not completely but far enough so that you can slide out the cassette deck mechanism so yeah um, it's quite a bit more involved than I initially thought it would be um, also, while I'm doing the cassette deck mechanism, I also found this little black tab inside of the chassis. You know, I, I don't know what it is. I've got no clue what this is. But, um, yeah, I guess we'll have to figure it out. All right, for some mysterious reason, um, a few of the cog wheels that are mounted inside the mechanism uh, suffer from a, so a sort of, uh, how to describe, a sort of plastic rot or mold, you know, which is like a powdery white substance I would say and uh, you can see the one uh, cogwheel that is still intact made out of that sort of plastic is right there okay and then there's a tiny cogwheel by the way at the front uh, let me show you oh there it is so this little cogwheel right here right there buried inside the mechanism there suffers from the same well let's call it a disease from the same disease as that large cogwheel I just showed you all right as I'm I'm cleaning the mechanism uh, well um, the, the whole thing started to fall apart uh, roughly half of that gear I showed you that diseased gear um, just fell off I, I didn't even have to touch it very much it um, yeah it split in half so uh, yeah it was high time I think that it needed uh, a replacement all right, uh, I undid the, the two screws. All right, so now the flywheel should simply lift off, I believe. Let's see. Oh no, there's one more to unscrew. So apparently the, the motor and the flywheel are one assembly. So let's undo this uh, let me see okay well yeah that always happens with me oh god okay Right, so now I should be able to to just lift up the assembly. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, look at that. So this is the motor assembly, and uh, the point on which the you could say the bearing on which the flywheel rests and uh, let's see if I can lift it up I can 
There you go. So there you have the flywheel. Interestingly enough, uh, oh man, yeah, this is the old rubber band. Interestingly enough, uh, the flywheel, this flywheel, has the same numbering going on as uh, the ITT cassette deck flywheel, uh, which I uh, restored recently, uh, link below the video. Um, and I think now I know why or what the function of these numbers uh, is. Um, in effect, when they balance at the factory, they balance out the flywheel, okay, um, they uh, need to figure out at which point to take away or a little bit of the mass of the flywheel such that it is balanced correctly when it turns around. And uh, as you can tell here, at the factory they removed a little bit of the mass of the flywheel at point six, uh, five, at point five, okay? Now, a uh, happy coincidence for us is that the little cogwheel that needed replacing, you know, is mounted on top of the flywheel and I think it's a press fit. So let's see if I can pull it loose. Uh, not so easily. So, um, okay, give me a moment to figure it out. All right, it would seem that that little cogwheel that I need to replace, uh, and where is the new one? So, the little cogwheel that I need to replace is apparently um, glued into place over a hexagonal nut. So this is the replacement cogwheel, okay? And you can see inside the profile is hexagonal, right? So we've got to replace the old part, which looks like this, by this. Now, if you look closely at the part, um, it is transparent and you can tell there is some sort of green stuff underneath and it's my opinion that this is a Loctite glue. Okay, so what I could do is um, heat it up and then try to release it that way or just break it apart since it's it's broken anyway. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to try the heat method first and uh, if that fails then I'm, I'm simply going to break it with a, with a pair of pliers. Alright, so um, I took a closer look at the stuff that I cleaned off of uh, this hexagonal fitting, let's say, and um, it turned out not to be actually uh, glue, you know, like the Loctite that I suggested, but it was more a sort of a, a silicone compound or, or glue uh, that was discolored. Uh, through oxidation from the little brass piece you see here. So, the, in effect, the uh, glue, you could say, had turned green through oxidation. So, um, I cleaned off this hexagonal piece completely uh, with alcohol and uh, I'm going to glue the new part, which is this, uh, over it uh, using neutral uh, silicone glue, you know, which actually is more used as, uh, they also call it RTV, okay, but it's, it is silicone. 
and um, this kind of silicone is used in high voltage circuits okay and it is um, neutral uh, chemically neutral which means that it won't cause uh, any corrosion or oxidation or anything like that so basically there is no uh, ammonia or other solvents in it which you would usually smell in, in the kind of uh, silicone paste you would use in a bathroom or in the kitchen or something like that okay so this is neutral silicone and uh, I'm going to use a little bit of it to glue the replacement uh, cogwheel on top of this flywheel axle, right? Alright, so I didn't exaggerate when I said I'm going to use the absolute minimum, okay, of RTV to uh, secure the, the, the new little cogwheel. So I, I barely covered it with a very thin layer of RTV and so now I'm going to press the little cogwheel on top of it like this. There you go. secured so there you go the absolute bare minimum of RTV and uh, well one cogwheel replaced two more to go all right I uh, cut loose that little plastic retainer ring from uh, this axle here and uh, that released this lever here and you also need to unhook uh, a spring okay and that spring here is um, hooked up to a little hook right here where I'm pointing at right there alright so um, that's one thing done now while I'm in here replacing the cogwheels or at least trying to do so um, I'm also going to have to replace this rubber belt here or band uh, which actually uh, actuates the counter mechanism right so let me take these wires out of the way first and give us a little more space to work with so the, this belt here he also needs replacing and it's um, running over a little wheel which is hidden down there inside there I don't know if you can see this but let, let me try and show you so the, it's running inside there there's a little pulley inside that little black cap Alright, so, and I need to somehow lift this black cap to be able to, to replace this rubber belt. Um, so, yeah, that's the next thing I need to figure out. Alright, I think I found out how to probably replace the, the little counter rubber belt. Um, and that is by lifting uh, this spindle here now uh, typically <laughs> this this spindle was also attached with one of those silly little rubber retainer rings okay so let me just lift it up there you go okay so there is the pulley over which the rubber belt fits okay so effectively what you need to do is to take off that little retainer ring and then you can just slide the spindle off 
and together with that the rubber belt so uh, now I need to do some cleaning of uh, the cogwheel here and the pulley and uh, then place it back in uh, with a fresh rubber belt I removed yet another few uh, of those plastic retainer rings one which fitted over this little axle here and then two large ones like these yeah which uh, like these here okay which fit around this metal bracket now I'm going to insert uh, the new cogwheel uh, and uh, so all I did actually was remove the retainer rings and temporarily removed uh, a spring okay which connects this black plastic assembly to this lever here. Now I'm not bending the lever I'm just uh, moving it up as much as I can without uh, without bending it without actually bending the metal right and I'm going to slide the new cogwheel in between and over its axle you know and uh, by using gentle force um, I think I should be able to do it yeah so let's see there you go I think I think I managed uh, did I yeah I think I did Okay, I think the new cogwheel is in place. So now give me a moment to replace all the other parts and then I'll show you the final result. Alright, so this cogwheel is uh, the replacement one. Alright, and uh, I also re, uh, well, I also inserted the uh, new counter. Uh, belt or the rubber belt for the counter and uh, the easiest way to do this is by inserting it from this way in so from the back side in into this space right there okay right there and then pulling it through the opening where where the spindle fits you know like this all right and I'm going to do it just to show you so I'm going to put a piece of wood here to block the uh, rubber band you know, I don't want it to slide away so you take the, the spindle all right and then you hook the rubber belt come on you hook the rubber belt over the pulley and you'll notice that the pulley has two little plastic tabs right on either side and that is to retain the rubber belt while you are sliding the uh, spindle back in place right so okay hang on uh, let me see that oh I did it the wrong way around so it needs to be like this like oh like well okay it doesn't matter so the the thing is you just need to insert it like this all right you slide it over the uh, axle and then you keep tension on the rubber band and you insert the spindle into its place like that all right so and then the result is the spindle uh, cogwheels should engage 
with the new cogwheel I installed there. Alright, so if I turn the spindle, you see the new cogwheel turns with it. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, one step done. We're close now to finishing, you know, replacing all the cogwheels and all that. Um, so, oh yeah, one more thing I wanted to uh, say is that the, the new cogwheel I installed, this one here, okay, so you need to install it that way up, you know, it has a little neck, okay, and that neck points upwards, or if you install the mechanism back into the cassette deck, uh, the neck of that new cogwheel needs to point inwards. All right. Oh, by the way, I also use uh, circlips on top of this cogwheel uh, and uh, one on top of the spindle, and I still need to install the circlips on this one here. Well, and here it is the completely rebuilt cassette deck mechanism for the Gründig. CF5000-2 cleaned reassembled and almost greased okay so yeah all in all nice little mechanism but not the most solid one or the most accurate one uh, I've seen um, partly due to the fact that they used uh, the, the people at Grundig used a, a lot of plastic instead of metal parts and um, although plastic is of course cheaper and it allows for special shapes to be used and all that uh, it also makes the mechanism lighter, you could say. Uh, you know, using a lot of plastic in a cassette deck mechanism, at least in my opinion, is not a very good idea. I mean, uh, a cassette deck mechanism, uh, if you want to, to play music really accurately, on a mechanism it needs to be really tight you know uh, without too much play or stuff like that you know so in the long run I mean when all the parts all the components are brand new uh, I'm sure this cassette deck will play uh, well quite well uh, but in the long run I mean over years and years of use, um, this kind of cassette deck will probably become less and less accurate. So, what I might have to check next is the power supply, which is located here, in this area up here, uh, and of course uh, this fuse here. And uh, while we're at it, I will also have to take a look at the display because, well, uh, you can tell it's it's hanging loose. It's hanging completely loose. So, yeah, I'll need to address this as well. Alright, so to uh, access the back of the main PCB, uh, what I need to do is to unscrew the bottom plate of the chassis. Alright, I'm um, uh, replacing the capacitors on the main board of the Grundig. And uh, usually what I do is, um, okay, it's this one I need to replace. All right. Usually, uh, what 
I usually do is I replace all of the capacitors at once. And I know people uh, on the internet, uh, you know, like Bob Anderson from the B. Anderson TV channel or uh, Shango from the Shango channel or Paul from the Mr. Carlson's. Uh, those are people that um, I watch their channels regularly and uh, okay I think it's these two um, and there's often debate between those people or well not face to face but I mean let's say a debate on whether you should change all the capacitors at once Uh, if you should change the capacitors all at once or if you just should change the and, and I'm talking about the electrolytics okay or if you should just change the electrolytics that are manifestly faulty or bad and it's a, an ongoing debate between those people as well, whom I consider to be experts in the field, uh, you could you could actually say they are experts in the field, and um, I would tend to lean towards the opinion where you know if you're going to restore something and you want it to work for a long, long time without faults. Um, so, without faults or anything like that. Um, then, yeah, I think in the long run, okay, 3.8 microfarad, uh, so 3.8 microfarad, and this is a 3.3 microfarad okay so 3800 nanofarad is 3.8 microfarad okay this one is let's say this capacitor for example that I'm I just took out of the Grundig yeah is rated for 3.3 microfarad okay and and if you look at if you look at its value uh, it's off by, let's say, roughly uh, 15%, say. Uh, but it's not very lossy, and the ESR is rather low. So this is actually not a bad capacitor. So I could leave it in, yeah. Uh, but this one is rated at 85 degrees Celsius. And... The capacitors that I use are generally rated for 105 degrees Celsius, okay, so higher uh, temperature rating, which uh, in theory at least should make them uh, degrade uh, much slowlier. So I would argue if you, if you take the effort to replace uh, some capacitors, then you might just as well, you know, replace them all, and and that way uh, rest easy that that you'll never, ever in your lifetime will have to replace capacitors again, uh, electrolytics, uh, yeah, a instead of of you know. Uh, going cheapskate and, and, and only replacing a few capacitors. Now, I realize that some people, some of my viewers are, I don't know, retirees with, with little money or students with little money, you know. And, and those people, for those people, uh, you know, buying capacitors is, is well, is something expensive really so um, 
yeah, to them I would say, well, you know, you don't need to replace all of them. Um, you can get away with replacing the ones that are manifestly bad. Um, but of course, uh, and then that will save you a buck in, in the short run. But in the long run, of course, um, it might cause you trouble. So there you go. I replaced all the electrolytics on the main board. Alright, so uh, from the top up there around the power supply, all the way down the board, left and right. I replaced all the electrolytics and uh, I'll give you a count later on but these are all the electrolytics. Uh, I'd say about a third of the electrolytics were bad. The others were reasonable. Uh, but like I said before, uh, if I'm going to do the effort to replace a few of them, uh, I might just as well replace all of them. Okay, so now I connected up the um, transformer via the AC plug to the AC and I'm measuring the voltage on the secondary of the transformer and uh, as you can tell it's around 13.6 volts. It fluctuates a little bit but yeah, it's, it's around 13.5, 13.6 volts. So, the transformer, um, I think, will work, uh, which is a nice thing. So, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to connect up the transformer back to the main board. And uh, I'm going to see uh, whether the main board generates uh, DC power, alright, because there could be a problem. Remember when we tried to switch on the cassette deck, it didn't react at all, so there was no power whatsoever available uh, to it to function. Also, uh, an interesting little detail, um, the display so the, the um, how do you call it, the DB, the decibel display, okay, uh, used for playback and recording, yeah, um, apparently it was lighted, uh, and it was lighted via a light pipe and a small incandescent bulb. You know, uh, I measured the bulb, the filament is, is broken. Okay, so that needs uh, repairing and more than likely I'm going to replace this light bulb with a blue LED. Uh, those who follow my channel know I have uh, an absolute uh, liking for blue LEDs, right? So uh, the light bulb was located right here where you see this round opening here. And this is a piece of um, transparent uh, acrylic plastic, all right. So, which functions as a light pipe and lights up the whole display, all right. So it runs the whole length of the display. So yeah, that's going to be replaced, and uh, then I'm also going to think a little about where I'm going to mount a an, an AC fuse uh, because up to now the only thing I can see is a DC uh, fuse not an AC fuse uh, but um, yeah I'm going to think a little about that um, also I need to have a look at the on off switch, the cassette decks on off switch, uh, because as you remember 
when I uh, tried it out, so where I tried to switch it on or off, uh, nothing really happened. All right, so it's quite possible that the switch um, might be broken. Just because you want to keep the authenticity of the device intact doesn't mean that you have to restore it and keep it in its original uh, unsafe state. Now, yet again, uh, as I've said so many times in the past, uh, one of the things that I noticed when I look at the Gründig you see in front of you yeah um, I noticed again some um, despicable uh, cost cutting that uh, uh, went on when uh, they designed and built the Gründig CF5000 uh, I'm sure some of the um, engineers at Gründig complained about that, but hey, you know, in a battle between accountants and uh, marketing department and engineers, it's often the engineers who pull the shorter straw, right? So, um, to cut corners, um, the uh, Gründig engineers had to design uh, a way of saving costs on the AC side of the uh, cassette deck and they did that by connecting the transformer up to the AC uh, but uh, without using uh, either a, a fuse or a switch on the AC side uh, of the transformer, yeah, which of course meant that the transformer was always on, uh, which incidentally also is very bad from a power consumption point of view, but also from a safety point of view. I mean, um, you know, the transformer was con continuously connected up to the AC, which means that. Uh, well, first of all, it was always running warm, yeah, which uh, shortens its life cycle time, right? And also, it exposes exposed it to you know risks like uh, uh, lightning strikes or shorts of any sort uh, on the AC side. So that's something that I, I absolutely wanted to fix, which, and incidentally, I did fix um, in a way that some of the purists among you might not like. But I did my best to keep the impact on the cassette deck minimal. And also, true to my philosophy, I made it reversible. So anyone in the future who wants to restore the cassette deck to its original state will be able to do so. But, so, what I did was I incorporated in the AC side uh, of the cassette deck a fuse and a switch, an on-off switch. Okay, so the fuse Let's see, the fuse is right there, right there, okay. So, and the cutout in the chassis that you see over there was already there. So, it was already available for use. So, I just mounted a few fuse holder there and I connected it up to, on one hand, to the AC side of the transformer, you can see it down there, all right, the white wire, which incidentally is fire resistant uh, wire, okay, so it is a special silicone, uh, uh, 
gained or I should say enclosed in a sort of glass fiber uh, coating all right so it's fire resistant okay so and then I connected up the fuse okay to uh, via the uh, same type of wire to uh, switch a single pole single throw uh, switch all right so um, this switch is rated at 120 volts uh, 6 amps but I looked it up it's uh, also rated to 3 amps 220 volts all right so the the uh, AC side of the cassette deck never uses more than roughly 100 uh, milliamps okay so this switch is more than uh, good enough for the um, for the cassette deck all right and uh, it's going to be mounted in the same opening where the original on off switch was located right here all right now for the uh, aesthetics uh, I'll find some sort of uh, remedy to that uh, so I'm not too worried about that now the original switch which you see down here okay was uh, is I should say connected up to the DC side uh, so in effect between the power supply and the rest of the main board all right so and the motor by the way of the cassette deck um, so there was always a little bit of DC apparently uh, going to the main board and um, it only really woke up you could say once the switch was thrown okay so the switch actually works yeah so it's the switch is fine uh, but what what so what really bothered me was that the cassette deck was basically always on albeit at lower power when the switch was in the off position and uh, yeah I, I didn't like that at all okay uh, oh and also by the way uh, the motor of uh, uh, the cassette deck was always running always running you know and, and that's really albeit at lower speed in the in the off position but it was always running so that that certainly explains a little bit uh, why there was so much wear and tear uh, on the cassette deck uh, mechanism well especially around the flywheel uh, of the cassette deck and as you've uh, uh, undoubtedly noticed earlier in the video so yeah um, I wanted to avoid that as well and uh, I'm hoping of course that the motor of the cassette deck uh, isn't completely worn out so the other thing I did and and uh, uh, was to uh, replace in the uh, readout so uh, on the panel of the cassette deck was to replace the original uh, uh, panel lighting which was a regular incandescent bulb and I replaced that by a blue LED all right now down there I'm sure you can see down there that little blue uh, resistor the original resistor was 27 ohms and I replaced that by a 650 ohms resistor which still gives plenty of current and voltage for the LED to light up brightly so the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mount a little reflector okay uh, on top of the LED with a, a little bit of tape 
So again, I'm doing this so that uh, my change, you could say, can be reversed at a later stage uh, if the one who owns this cassette deck uh, decides to do so. Okay, and it will be mounted on top of the of the LED. Okay. Um, more specifically to uh, direct all the light from the LED back into the plastic light guide okay so there you go that's uh, what I did and uh, that's uh, what I'll do you know and and the main message is if something is basically basically unsafe um, there's absolutely no shame in trying to correct that. Of course, in my opinion, you should try to do it with minimal impact on the device. But still, um, uh, I, I believe it's a wise course to follow. Alright, I have to put the camera on the tripod because I need both my hands to show you this. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, well there you go. That's about as much as I can let you hear right now. But as you can tell, um, it works, sort of. But one of my problems is um, with the mechanism at least is it's extremely touchy it's very 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 touchy and the the neither the fast forward or the rewind function work properly you know, the, the rewind function doesn't work at all yet so I don't know what's going on with that so I still need to check that out all right there's a little part that I need to repair somehow and uh, the solution I have in mind is this so when you slide in a cassette in here this black pin here used to have a hook and the hook would fit all over the edge of the cassette on top here all right and now that hook uh, seems to have broken off somewhere in the past and I need to repair that and what I found in my uh, collection of, of spare parts is something which looks like this yeah, it's a little bit like hook shaped okay and it would fit right over the camera like this all right so this little hook part here would be attached to what's to what remains of the old hook uh, with, with glue and then uh, it would fit right over a cassette uh, which you could then slide underneath the little hooky part yeah and then that would that would um, yeah that would solve the problem of the missing hook alright instead of uh, placing the display back with the clamping mechanism it originally used um, it was just too floppy um, I opted rather for using captain tape uh, all along its edge to keep it in place um, no I don't want it to use glue because glue is is just too permanent and uh, if in the future uh, the, the future owner wants to do some repair work um, on the display uh, I think uh, he or she would be grateful for the fact that I I didn't uh, permanently glue the display to the cabinet. Um, I also fitted the new on-off switch 
all right and all I have to do here is enlarge the opening slightly uh, because this switch has a, a round profile whereas the original switch uh, had a square profile right so I used a little file a, a round jeweler's file something like this to open up uh, you see this one here right here so to open up the uh, mounting opening for the switch I did leave the old switch in place uh, in the sense that I packaged it inside a plastic little bag which I attached with a zip tie to the inside of the cabinet all right so and obviously I left it in the on position right so uh, yeah uh, that's the old switch and I leave it inside and I leave it mounted as it was um, just so if somebody in the future decides to restore the cassette deck to its original uh, form well then they can simply mount the switch back if they want to uh, the AC wires are running along the outside of the chassis and uh, I was lucky in that the the chassis already has cutouts in the, the, the bracing plate which is uh, attached in the middle, well more or less in the middle of the chassis, alright. Uh, the bracing plate uh, supports the, uh, on the other side, the transformer and, I, and also the power transistor for the, the voltage regulation uh, on the main PCB all right and I just used part of this opening here to attach the AC fuse I mounted all right so in that sense I was lucky I didn't have to drill any holes um, so yeah the only damage quote unquote that I did was uh, slightly opening up this opening here to be able to mount the new switch so that's as far as I got right now the next step is to check whether I can at least temporarily mount back the front plate to see if everything fits and uh, and then I have to start uh, uh, well some cosmetic uh, repair work on the cassette neck. No fabricator, but um, I wanted to recreate um, a cap which encloses the space where the cassette sits on the cassette deck, right? And this is the lower cover, yeah, which covers the reading head and the capstan and all those things. And I took this as a model for the missing cap, which sits uh, on top, above it, like this, alright? So, it's not identical, uh, obviously. And it's an entirely different material than this. I mean, I built this out of sheet um, copper. I think it's a 0 0.8 millimeter thick copper. And uh, I cut the pieces out of that sheet, which I then bent and soldered. Uh, to each other all right so you can see where I soldered separate parts that I needed to cut out separately that is and uh, yeah I soldered everything together and bent everything to the right shape and uh, that's the result it's not perfect far from it 
um, but I think it will do for what I intended to do, namely to re replace the missing cap. Alright, we're going to paint all the parts of the Gründig tape deck. Uh, the one part that I made, fabricated myself, and then the original lower panel for the cassette deck, which I unmounted, and then of course the case itself uh, but first we're going to lay a uh, ground layer and then the paint itself afterwards and oh yeah I have a guest spectator my mother's uh, house chicken yeah for some reason she's curious to see uh, what's happening here uh, don't ask me the name of the chicken but uh, it has a name and as you can tell it's completely tame and curious so uh, yeah back to painting first the uh, ground layer and uh, then the top coat all right here's a final glimpse of what the cassette deck looks like now just before I'm going to mount back the top of the cabinet here is the, the little cover that I uh, fabricated for the top of the cassette deck all right it, it doesn't look 100% like the original but I think for having it made myself out of copper sheet it's certainly not not too bad all right before i'm going to close the cabinet app of the grundig cassette deck i'm going to give it a last run with a calibration uh, cassette uh, on it are several uh, frequencies recorded pure sine wave frequencies but uh, the frequency we're going to watch now is the 3 kilohertz frequency all right so uh, just to see how uh, accurate the cassette deck is in playing the 3 kilohertz sine wave which is recorded on that tape over there and uh, I hooked up the output channel of uh, the cassette deck to my oscilloscope up there and um, uh, we're going to watch the sine wave while uh, the sound is playing on the cassette deck all right so here we go As you can tell, there, there's quite a bit of flutter on, um, on the, the cassette deck, alright? So, um, the frequency is rather accurate. It's uh, reproducing uh, uh, almost a 3 kilohertz sound, yeah? So, it's a, more like 2.980 hertz okay so 2 kilohertz 980 hertz uh, but as you can tell there's also quite a bit of uh, a flutter uh, on the sine wave and um, now and then there is some wow too okay so that, that wobble in the sine wave um, and I, I dare say that the wobble is probably produced by two factors uh, namely the quality of the cassette which is in the player and the quality of the replacement cogwheels that I mounted a 
Okay, so now it's switched over to lower frequency. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm monitoring the, the, the frequency and, and the pureness of the frequency. Um, and it's reasonable. But let's say for a true hi-fi connoisseur, uh, this is below par. Yeah, so it's okay. Let's say it like that. So the, the sound quality is reasonable, but it's certainly not what I would qualify as uh, high fidelity. All right. Now, let's not forget the um, cassette deck um, <coughs> has aged um, and isn't brand new anymore. So, yeah. Um, it is to be expected that the sound quality of the playback uh, won't be perfect any longer uh, unless of course I would replace the mechanism of the cassette deck by a completely new uh, fresh one so to speak uh, which I do not have alright so yeah let's say the, quali the sound quality is reasonable but is by no means perfect Final look at the Grundig CF5000 2 cassette deck. Um, is it perfect as a restoration? I mean, no, by no means. Uh, there are a few flaws that I didn't manage to restore completely, like the damage here and some slight dimples on the case. Um, also, I seem to understand that I, I understand that there is probably a translucent little door meant to be here um, and uh, try as I might I, I couldn't find that, that plastic door so to speak or that cover also you know I replaced the power switch the original power switch by my own power switch. Uh, so some purists might say this is not original and they'd be right. Uh, but I did it out of safety concerns. So um, for all of you there, my uh, faithful viewers and all other visitors to my channel, thank you very much for watching this video and for your patience. Um, and, uh, well, I'll see you soon.